Amen. Well, I, first time I wore this to Union, if you know Randy Lewis, he walked by me. He said, Preacher, I said, yeah. He said, my daddy had a 56 Buick and had the same color seat covers on it. <laughs> People don't have to be a blessing to you, don't they? Amen. But I, if I ever, I want to find one because Jesse really likes it. And uh, so I'm going to have to get Brother Jesse one. And uh, I think I'm going to buy all the deacons at Union one make them wire them. Amen. <laughs> um, amen. I've enjoyed being here this week. Amen. I've enjoyed the, the Lord every evening. Appreciate him coming by and visiting with us. And what a privilege it is. And. I guess Union gets tired. I know so I told Kim, somebody told Kim one time, said, hey, how you put up with that? Kim could probably tell this stuff better than I could, amen? She's heard it so many times, and and uh, so, but I, I like this kind of stuff, and I wanted to read it to you, but I read it all the time, this kind of stuff to the church when I get it, but I just like this kind of stuff, and you know, people say, well, preacher, I don't think we're to laugh and do all them things when we get to church, but I think we're to be the happiest people in the world, amen? And uh, I, I think we're to enjoy life. And, and I was thinking, uh, y'all mailed a letter to our church, and I got it uh, this week, uh, Monday, I think it was, or maybe got it Sunday morning. I guess they had it to me Sunday morning. You're having a golf tournament, and, and we really got some golfers in our church. I mean, if y'all want to, just go ahead and give us that trophy if you give one away. And uh, <laughs> uh, But, uh, man, we really got some. You know, what's so funny is we go play golf, and we get around all these people, and we was playing over Elizabethan, and it's me and Jack and Tom and Sam. And we got the whole nine, and we, you know, we, we ain't never played a serious hole of golf yet. And we get the whole nine, and them guys are just standing there looking at us. Man, we're just telling big tales, and we're laughing and everything. Them guys just looking at us. One of them guys said, they're not going to tee off till y'all leave. <laughs> and what they was telling us was, we're serious about what we're doing. Hey, man, so if you're serious, you don't want to go play with us. But we will take you trophy because we we'll probably win that thing. Hey, Amen. And uh, So make sure you have a nice one so uh, uh we can uh, display it everywhere we go, you know, because we, we'll probably win that thing, amen. Because uh, <clears throat> Sam plays with us, and uh, Sam keeps a good scorecard. So we'll, we'll, probably, we'll probably win that thing, amen. <laughs> you can talk to Tom at church, Tom will tell you what that means, amen. Well, but we have a good time. I, I tell you this, the last time we played, Tom hit one in the rough. And uh, I hit all mine in the rough, so I can talk about Tom. But Tom hit one in the rough. And I was sitting back on that golf cart, Bob, and he lined up, buddy. And he hit it in the rough again. But when it hit in the rough this time, it hit a big rock. And when it come out, it come out in the fairway. And I about fell off that cart laughing. He turned around and said, I meant that to play it like that, preacher. <laughs> anyway. well, we have a good time. But I, I got this some years ago. I've read it to the church probably a million times, I guess, and when they come hear me preach. But I still like this kind of stuff. It said, uh, as a young minister, I was asked to, by the funeral director to hold a graveside service for a homeless man with no family or friends. And the service was to be held at a cemetery back in the country, and this man would be the first to be laid to rest there. As I was not familiar with the backwoods area, I became lost, and being a typical man, I didn't stop for directions. I arrived an hour late and saw the back hole in the crew and who were eating lunch. However, the hearse was nowhere in sight, and I apologized to the workers for my tardiness, stepped to the side of the open grave and saw that the vault lid was already in place, assuring the workers I would not hold them up for long, and since this was the proper thing to do, I asked them if they would gather around, even though they were still eating their lunch. I poured my heart and my soul out. I preached the, to the workers, began to say, Man, praise the Lord and glory. I preached and I preached like I'd never preached before. 
from Genesis all the way to Revelation. I closed the lengthy service with a prayer, walked to my car, and as I was opening the door and taking off my coat, overheard one of the workers saying to another, I had never seen anything like that before, and I've been installing septic tanks for 20 years. <laughs> well, that'd be something I'd do, I guess. But I tell you, I read that stuff and I still laugh. I've read it for years, but I just can imagine. I, I get to thinking too much, amen. But uh, my daddy is 82, and he had a preacher friend, and he told my daddy, he said, Preacher, I'm, I'm the world's worst. He said, I get in the pulpit, and I think of something. I get tickled. I've been to funerals and got tickled. And he said, I was preaching this dear saint in my church's funeral, and I preached her funeral. I stepped down the head of the casket, and I thought about something she had told me, and I got tickled. And so I was tickled. I had my head down. I was just laughing. People was coming by and said, one dear saint come by and said, Preacher, I know it's hard today. <laughs> And uh, it happens sometimes. You have your Bibles tonight, 1 Samuel chapter number 9. 1 Samuel chapter number 9. Well, Bob did a good job. And, and you know, when you're studying and you're asking the Lord what he would have you to preach, and I told you on Sunday night, I just want to preach what he told me to preach this week. But, and then you hear the songs that's sung and you, you know that you're in tune and uh, with God, and that it, you feel like it's exactly what uh, He ordered. So, I want to preach to you tonight from this passage in Second Samuel chapter number nine. It's a great passage. It's a great story uh, when you look at this young man and and all the things that takes place in his life. And the thing is, tonight as I was listening to Bob sing tonight. A little over two years ago, my brother was 55 year old and he passed away. And I remember going to Georgia, me and my oldest brother did his funeral. And I, I, I've read about heaven. I've sung about heaven. But I walked in that chapel that day and I looked over at my brothers. We headed into the chapel and I said, you know, I've read about it. Rick, I've sung about it, I've preached about it and, and all the things about it. But I said, David knows about it today. Yeah. And the thing is tonight is this, the greatest thing to know when you leave this walk of life is this, it, it don't matter what kind of automobiles we drive tonight, no matter how much money we make, no matter what kind of homes we live in, what matters is when we leave this walk of life that heaven is our home. Amen. That's what matters. Amen. And I, I hope, hey listen, if you sit in this building lost tonight, you don't have to leave this building lost. Right. Hey, you can know Jesus Christ before you leave this building. You know, I, I believe we've missed it in our day. And I, 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 I'm, I'm 53 year old. And I look back in my ministry. And I look back at, and I'm not saying all preaching I heard was bad. I'm just saying there's a lot of preaching that I heard and a lot of preaching I did in my young ministry that I believe pushed people from us than drew people to us. And in my last years, by the help of God, I want to point people to Jesus Christ. You say, why, preacher? Because I think that's the most important thing. Because I believe this. I believe if, hey, they get to Jesus, Jesus can take care of a lot of things in their life. Amen. And a lot of things that we think we had to tell them, the Lord will tell them. He'll work in their life. I tell people all the time, you give a Baptist church somebody, they can make them look like a Christian, but God can change their life. And and if you don't know him tonight, he can change your life. Amen. He can make a new creature out of you, and you don't have to leave this being lost. But in 2 Samuel chapter number 9, and verse number 1, he said this, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? There was one of the house of Saul, a servant whose name was Ziba, and and when he, they had called him unto David, the king said to him, Are thou Zeban? He said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God to him? And Zeba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Zeba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machar, the son of Abinadab in Lodabar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machar, the son of Ammonel from Lodabar. Now when the Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, 
he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. David said to him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. Thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant, that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called Aziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertaineth to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore, and, I, and thy sons and thy servant, shall till the land for him. Thou shalt bring forth in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But the thee the shelf, my master's son, shall eat bread all the way at my table. Now Zeba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Zeba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. And for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all that dwelt in the house of Zeba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did he continued the king's table and was lame on both his feet. Father, thank you again tonight for the privilege that we have again to sit in the house of God. Lord, I thank you for the privilege to come this week. Lord, I thank you for what our hearts have felt every night and our ears have heard. God, I thank you for the touch from another world. God, we need another touch tonight. God, we need another refreshing tonight. And God, I pray you just speak to you, servant. Hide us behind the cross. And God, may we glean the truth from this passage. You'd have us a glean. And all you do for us, we'll praise you and thank you. For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. When you look at these 13 verses, there's a great picture here. There's a great picture of the grace of God in this passage, and that's what I want to preach on tonight, a picture of the grace of God. You need to remember now that Jonathan was Saul's son, and Mephibosheth is Saul's grandson. And if you look at, you think that if you look at the way the generation was, that it was supposed to be handed to Mephibosheth, but David is king. And in that day that the story took place, Mephibosheth would be considered a threat to David's throne and an arch enemy. But however, David had determined to fulfill the promise that he made to his friend years before and show kindness to the family of Jonathan. If you go back and study your Bible, you'll find out that God put a great relationship and a great friendship between David and Jonathan. And can I tell you something tonight? Hey, you better count it an honor if you got friends. Amen. And the thing is tonight that Jonathan and David was great friends. And you look at this passage, you see that the word kindness in verse number one is was the same word that's used in 1 Samuel chapter 20 when David and Jonathan made their covenant promise with each other. And regarding the future. It means mercy. It means long loving kindness or grace as it is used in the Old Testament. The Bible said this in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse number 10. Paul said this, By the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I want you to notice my winter introduction that God does what he does by his grace. Not, not that we deserved it, but he did it because he loved us. Amen. Because that he cared about us and he extended grace uh, to you and I. Not only does he extend grace and mercy to us before we get saved, he extends grace and mercy to us after we get saved. Amen. And, and he watches over us and he takes care of us. But Paul had desired the uh, severest kind of judgment. Hey, if anybody deserved judgment, probably Paul did that before he got saved. He, I mean, all that he ever did, hey, was try to stop the work of God and persecute Christians and all them things. But God had mercy on Paul. Yeah. Hey, Amen. And then the Bible said this. Paul said this, I am what I am by the grace of God. Yeah. Now, it's not nothing that we did, but it's what he does in us 
that makes us, hey, uh, what we are today. We cannot do one thing by ourselves. Hey, we cannot pull ourselves up our own boost chains uh, into Jesus Christ going to Calvary and dying uh, and resurrecting in order that you and I could have life. Amen. But when you get here, I, I want you to notice something here. If there's any goodness in us, we deserve none of his glory. But you say, preacher, who ought to get the credit for what God does to us? Jesus Christ. That's why I got a problem when preachers tell you how great they are. I tell people all the time, when people tell you how great they are and they shake your hand, count your fingers when you get them back, amen. Something's wrong when people get telling you how great they are. Hey, listen to me. They ain't nothing about us, hey, that's great other than what Jesus Christ did in us. And Paul's trying to tell us that in that passage. But the, really the essential the story of grace in the life of Mephibosheth is this. It could have been and should have been king of Israel, Mephibosheth should have. But God had a plan. God had a plan. And the thing is, is when you get here, you find out, again, he was a grand of son. He was the first king of Israel and all because of events in his life. It didn't turn out the way that. A lot of people thought it was going to turn out, but listen to me. Life's not going to turn out for us like we thought it was going to turn out. But God had a plan for Mephibosheth. God had a will for Mephibosheth. God had a will for David. And I want to tell you something tonight. I tell young people all the time, God has a will for your life. You find out what God wants you to do, and you join him. And you just serve him. Now, I'm just like every other parent. Now, I'm going to tell you what we do when they get old enough to start college and everything, even for that, but especially there, we start trying to direct our life, really. You know, we say, now, this is probably what you need to do. I remember when my oldest boy was going to college, and I told him, I said, I said, Nick, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to go get a history degree and teach history at the high school. I said, why in the world are you going to do that? He said, well, that's what I want to do. I said, man, as much as you like sports and stuff, I said, won't you go into sports medicine? You make more money than teaching high school history. And this is what he said to me. He said, Daddy, when I come through and you preach to me that we're supposed to do what God told us to do. I said, that's right. I knew I was in trouble right then. That's <laughs> what he said. He said, I prayed about it. And I asked God what he wanted me to do. And he wants me to go to college, get a degree in history, and teach history in high school. We went on down the road. I said, you know what I'd do if I was you, Nicholas? He said, what? I said, I'd go to college, get me a degree in history, go down to high school and teach high school history. Amen. Hey, the thing is, is God has a call on your life. God has a plan for your life. And you need to find what God wants you to do in your life and serve Him with all of your heart. You say, why is a lot of people miserable tonight, preacher? Hey, because they won't come to grips with what really God wants them to do in their life. But I want to give you some things here, right here, about grace. In verse number one through verse number four, because of the reach of grace. Can I tell you tonight that God's grace uh, and God's grace is able to reach people uh, where nobody else thought he could reach them from. Amen. And when you get here, you look in verse number two, or verse number three, grace reached him in spite of a crippling childhood. If you go back to 2 Samuel and read it, you know what happened to Mephibosheth? Here he is. Hey, they're keeping him. This maid is keeping Mephibosheth. And all of a sudden, danger comes. And she picks Mephibosheth up to run with him. And she drops him. And he becomes crippled because of that fall. Now listen to me. Now, here he is. He was all right when she picked him up. But she begins to run with him. And she dropped him. I want you to grab that point because I'm going somewhere. And I'll be right back there in just a minute, all right? Hey, because of what happened in our life, hey, because of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he dropped us. 
Adam dropped us, but now I want you to, I got to hurry up so I can get where I'm going. Listen to me. We find Mephibosheth, he's twisted. We find Mephibosheth, he's bruised. We find Mephibosheth when he cannot help himself when you get to 2 Samuel chapter number 9. You say, preacher, where was we at? We couldn't help ourselves. But I want you to notice something else. Not only did grace uh, uh, reach us in the spite of a crippling childhood, but grace reached him in a land of barrenness. Lodabar means this. It means the land of no bread. It means a place of no communication. It means a place where there was no exile. He was in a barren place. Where was you and I at? Amen. I'm building where I want to go. Just hang with me. And he said this, but God's grace can reach where no one ever knows anybody's living. God can reach where they're at. Amen. You know what? If we're not careful, we'll give up on people. You know where my dad pastors tonight, there's a lady that used to go to his church. She's in heaven now. But for 50 years, she prayed for her husband. And I remember one night, I was going to church there, and Daddy called me and said, hey, I need you to meet me up at the hospital. I need you to help me. And I went up there to make a visit with him, and I heard her. <laughs> For I ever got there, I heard her. Ooh, in the hospital. Hey, son, she was in the hall, uh, and she was clapping them hands, uh, and she was jumping up and down, uh, and she was shouting. Uh, and I ran in the corner, uh, and I heard her. I never will forget it. She said, well, let's see, uh, Raymond just got in. Amen. Uh, Fifty years she prayed for him before he got saved. But I want you to know something else. You find thirdly of all that grace reached him in an enslaved condition. Now listen to me, he's living in the house of Makar, the son of Abinel in Lodabar. Although he's probably a rich man, uh, Makar was. Uh, hey, because he helped David on the flight out of Jerusalem, his name means sold. And it's a reminder even at our best that we tonight are sold in to slavery. Yeah. You say, where's we at, preacher? We're on slave block. Yeah. Hey, we're lost. We need the Savior. Right here is where I want to get to preach, right here. Now listen to me. He dropped him. She dropped Mephibosheth. Adam dropped us. Hey, if we'd have got what we deserve, we'd have been in hell. But grace was extended to you and I. I want you to notice this verse of Scripture right here. In verses number 5 through verse number 8, because of the resource of grace. I want you to imagine just for a minute, here is Mephibosheth. He's down in Lodabar. He's down at Makar's house. I done told you down in Lodabar, there's no good news in Lodabar. There's nothing down there. I mean, it's a place of no bread. It's a place where there's no communication. I don't know what a Mephibosheth was sitting in. I don't know if he was laying in the bed. I don't know if he was sitting in the wheels. I do not know. Uh, hey, but I do know his condition. Uh, the Bible said that he was lame uh, on both of his feet. Uh, and I can see him, though, as he sits there right? and out the wind where no good news ever comes uh, and nothing ever happens in Lodabar right? uh, that's good. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, Mephibosheth's looking out the window uh, and, the ch and the king's chariot uh, uh, pulls up in the driveway uh, and the servant comes over uh, and knocks on the door uh, and they open the door and say, what can I help you with? Uh, he said, I come from the king's palace. Uh, I come from the king's house and the king you ain't getting it has sat with the thief himself has sent for him I see that servant walks in there and he picks the thief himself up with his legs lame and carries him over to the chariot and he sets the thief himself in that chariot you say preacher what's wrong as a 11 year old boy I was lost I was on my way to hell and 
and I need a savior. And the Holy Ghost come by where I was one night and prick my heart and show me I was lost and carried me down to the king's house. Amen. I ain't never been the same since. Amen. I want to ask you now, you ever been carried down to the king's house? Hey, you remember when he changed your life? You remember when he made a new creature out of you? You remember when all things passed away? And behold, all things come new. You remember that day? Hey, man, what a day. And Mephibosheth, never any good news. All of a sudden, Mephibosheth's headed up to the king's place. Hey, man. Hey, can I tell you tonight, devil lie to you. He'll tell you how wonderful it is out there. He'll tell you how much fun you'll have out there. But I want to tell you something. They ain't nothing like being at the king's house. Amen. They ain't nothing like being a part of the king's family. Amen. But I want you to know something else. Now good news is coming. In verse number eight, grace is always unconditional. Amen. Hey. David didn't put no conditions on it. He said, let's get down to Lodabar and get Mephibosheth and get him up here. Hey, you say, what happened, preacher? One day, his son said, hey, I'll take their place. He didn't put no conditions on it. This is all he said. Just come as you are and I'll change your life. Amen. Hey, listen to me. If you're waiting to get better, you won't get saved. If you're waiting to do good, you won't do good. I'm going to tell you what you need to do. Realize your loss. Run to Jesus. He'll help you. Amen. You know what? He don't put no conditions on it. He said, whosoever will. Amen. You say, what do you believe, preacher? Whosoever will. Hey man, we put conditions on it. Hey man, I told my church just a few weeks ago, I won't tell you how stupid preachers are. I talk about them, I am one. Hey, but listen to me. There's a young man a few years ago. I was preaching at a camp meeting in West Virginia. On Monday night, I sat down. One of the pastors in the area where I come from, not far from where I pastored in, sat down on the people's side of me and said, you ain't going to believe what happened in our county yesterday. I said, what happened? He said, there's a boy come to church uh, and his hair was a little long. Uh, and the preacher got down beside of him and said, go get your hair cut uh, and then God will save you. Is that not the stupidest thing uh, you ever heard? Hey, Amen. That is crazy. That's crazy preaching. Hey, God didn't put no conditions on it. Hey, man. Boy, that preacher looked over at me. I loved it, Brother Ronnie. I was hoping he was going to ask me. He said, what do you think? I said, the only man in the Bible ever got a haircut went blind. Hey, man. I was dying for him to ask me. I was waiting on him to ask me. Hey, listen to me. It ain't about them things. It's about where have you ever met Jesus Christ and has he ever changed your life? Hey, man. God didn't put no conditions on it. God said, come as you are. Hey, man. David was not wanting anything in return. He was going to love Mephibosheth like he is his own. You say, why did he do that, preacher? He based his love on how he loved Jonathan. He did it for Jonathan's sake. Whew. You say, preacher, why did he come from the ivory palace of glory? He did it for the Father's sake. The Father gave him to us so we could be saved. Hey, man, I don't see how y'all stay playing. Hey, man, I mean, when you get to thinking about how wonderful it is to be saved. I tell them at church, I know you ain't got to be like Brother Wesley running around hollering, kicking, stomping. But I don't see how people stay planted when you get to thinking about how good God is and where he brought you from. And he didn't put no conditions on it. He said, just come as you are and I'll change your life. Amen. Aren't you glad he didn't say you had to have money in your pocket? You had to be rich. Had to be from a well-known family. God said, just come. Hey, man, I'm not being mean and ugly, folks. 
When I was in Sunbride, and I left Sunbride and went to North Carolina. We run buses in both of them places. I know some of my bus people. Brother, Ronnie, I know they did. Went there on Sunday morning to help some of the little kids get ready to come to church. I know they did. They come to church. You know what? I had this old, I had this couple, boy, they was real spiritual. And they said, Brother Wesley, him kids are going to tire our church up. And as spiritual as Brother Wesley is, I said this, I don't care. <laughs> I said, my kids have tore a few things up. Hey, I think you got to make them mine. I don't think you can just turn them wild, hog loose. Hey, but listen to me. They ain't never been to church. They don't know. But I'm going to tell you what it's wonderful. It's when you preach and you see them little kids step out of the pew whoo, and head to God. And God don't put no conditions on to how mom and daddy's living, how my mom and papa's living, how anybody else is living. God just says, come and I'll change your life. He don't put no conditions on it, amen. We'd have children's church, Brother Ron and Sam Fritz say, why do you have children's church, Brother Wesley? I said, just teach them little kids about Jesus. Hey, yeah. Amen. I'd hear that couple that did our children's church. I'd hear her come up steps a few Sundays. Tommy, she'd be doing this. Woo! I said, one just got in, sure as the world. Amen. I, hey, the thing is, is this. I, hey, I, there's just something about people getting saved. Amen. You ever, hey, do you remember when your kids got saved? There's just something about you getting saved. There ain't nothing like watching your kids get saved. Amen. I remember when Nicholas was little. I would him to mine. He went to church, and I don't agree with this stuff, but they said, if you want to go to heaven with your mom and dad, raise your hand. Repeat this prayer to me. Nicholas was little. He come home. He said, Dad, I got saved. I said, how do you know? They said, if I want to go to heaven with your mommy, just repeat this prayer, and I go. I called my daddy. I said, Dad, I'm in a mess. He said, what's wrong? I said, Nicholas thinks he got saved because he repeated a prayer. Now he said, hey, son, I'll just help you pray and just pray and just keep a preaching to him. You and Kim just keep telling him about Jesus. But I remember that night, Ronnie. I preached one Sunday night and I got home, laid down in the bed and I heard. I said, what? Nick said, Daddy, I need to talk to your mother a minute. I stepped out in the living room, tears in his eyes and he said, Daddy, I'm lost. I said, ooh. I said, I'll tell you how to get saved. <laughs> he got saved in the living room of the parsonage where I pastored. Yeah. Hey, then one day, Kim called me. We was building a wing on our church where I pastored it. Kim said, uh, you need to come home. Allison wants to talk to you. I said, Kim, you just have to tell Allison you got to wait. And I mean, they're over here on this building. And I can't leave right now. She said, oh, you need to leave. She said, Allison needs to talk to you. I said, okay, so I went over to the house. I, I walked in, I sat down on the couch. I, I said, what's wrong? I, she said, Daddy, I, I just wanted you and Mama to tell me one more time I, how I could get saved, amen. I, I, she got saved. I, one day, Kim come in from school, and that big old boy's here Monday night. I, I, she, he's standing behind her, and Kim stuck the door, a key in the door of the house. I, he said, Mother, I'm lost. I need a Savior. I, hey, man, hey, I'm telling you. I, hey, God didn't say because you was a preacher's kid, I, a drunk's kid, whatever. God said, just come and I'll change your life. Amen. He didn't put no conditions on it. You might not get out of here tonight. Amen. I want you to know something. He said this. Not only is grace un unconditional, but grace is undeserving. We didn't deserve it. Hey, I said that's sad. Hey, you say, preacher, what is grace? Hey, grace did not give us what we deserve. It gave us what we didn't deserve. Hey, man. He sung about it a while ago. Hey, listen to me. I know the Bible said the streets are gold and the walls are jasper and the gates are pearl. But I'm going to tell you something. I don't care if it's gravel roads and picket fences. If Jesus is there, that's what matters. Amen. Hey, you say, why, preacher? Because grace was extended to us. Don't you know something? When you look here, it's undeserving. Mephibosheth did not do one thing to deserve David to come and get him. David went and got him out of the love of his heart and the mercy of his heart. That's why Jesus came where we was. Amen. 
Now, Pistol said, now, preacher, I went looking for him. No, you didn't. They might have been along in there, but you weren't looking for him. Oh, but listen to me. You remember that night when he came looking for you? Right. Amen. And he saved you. And he made you a new creature. And he gave you something you didn't even deserve. Right. Amen. I want you to know something here. Bible said in Romans chapter 4, verse number 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. You know what Methuselah said? He said, oh, Methuselah said, I ain't nothing but a dead dog. Amen. I've always wanted to preach on this. I ain't never got together, but I've always wanted to preach on this. How about them dogs? Amen. Hey, when you look at the Gentiles, that's what they thought. Dogs. And the Bible said, he came into his own, and his own received him not. You will say, preacher, what ought to make us Gentiles shout tonight that are saved? That it swung a door wide open for us. Amen. Amen. Hey, when he resurrected, that veil went from top to bottom. He said, now, whosoever will can come. Now, I don't know if this is true, but it's good preaching. They told me when I was in college that, hey, then that veil was rent from top to bottom. I know y'all wonder if I've ever been there, but I have a few days, but I didn't learn that much. But anyway, when they say when that veil was rent from top to bottom, that that night they sold it back together. I don't know if this is true, but it makes good preaching. They said the next morning they got up and it was rent from top to bottom again. You know what he was telling them? Hey, the way was open to Jesus Christ. Hey, man, he paid the way. I want you to look at this last thing about grace. Look here. What he says, grace, because of the riches of grace. The grace of God is supply of his favor toward us of the abundance of his riches. Romans 1, 7 says this, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. Hey, we're rich tonight. We're rich. Hey, our father owns her all tonight. Amen. And we're part of his family. Hey, man. Do you, hey, you know when I like to come to church when the Lord comes, hey, amen, and watch us with us, hey, amen. But you know what? Ain't it wonderful you can just go to church and you don't even have to be a member there, just like it's been this week, and boy, they get to sing and you just feel the Lord come in, just like you were family, hey, amen. Hey, man. Hey, we'll not be strangers. Hey, man. You say, preacher, what's our problem? Well, we think if it ain't happening at our church, it ain't happening. That's the craziest thing I ever heard about. Amen. Amen. Hey, listen to me. I just want to go where it's happening. Amen. I just want to get around it. Hey, I just want to, hey, I, wherever God's at of doing something, I want to be there to help him. Amen. Amen. I want you to know something here. You find out, hey, the riches of grace restores our position. Our position was restored in Jesus Christ. Adam dropped us. Second Adam picked us up. Amen. Hey, man. You might not be able to stay glued here in a little bit. Hey, he was sitting there. Hey, listen to me. He's sitting at the king's table now with the rest of the kids. Yeah. <laughs> hey, man. You remember when you used to hate to go to church? You remember when you didn't want to go to church? Now you like to go to church. <laughs> That's what he's talking about. You remember when you used to hate to get around Christian people, but now that's the people you want to get around? That's what he's talking about. Hey, man. Hey, now he's sitting at the king's table. I like what this old black preacher in Georgia said. He said this. He's sitting at the table, and under the table is the condition. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. You say, preacher, why does that make sense? Oh, everybody may remember what you used to be. But Jesus don't remember. Hey, them things are gone. Hey, he washed them away. Hey, man, when we say, Lord, I'm a sinner, he forgave us, made us as if we'd never sinned. Hey, man. I read this story of this little boy got saved and he went to a dignified church, you know. Ain't like shouting, none of that stuff. So he's sitting there on the pew and man, the choir began to sing. That little boy just shout. Hey, young man, just shout, praise God. Native deacons went to him and said, Preacher, you got to quiet him down. He's just resting the services. So the preacher said, okay. So he went down over and said, hey, Johnny. 
He said, uh, you like cowboy boots? He said, I sure do, preacher. He said, I'll tell you what, you like that red power down there at the Western store? In that one? Oh, he said, I do, preacher. He said, well, if you'll calm down, quit interrupting services, I'll buy you them cowboy boots. Little John said, okay. Sunday rode around. Little Johnny sat down on the pew. Choir gets singing. Old Johnny gets squirming. I mean, he, I mean, he was doing everything he could sit in that chair. He met the old preacher, got preaching on the cross. He and me and old Johnny come out of our son. He said, praise God, cowboy boots or no cowboy boots. I'm praising God. Amen. I, hey, listen to me. I, hey, I, when you get to thinking about what he did for you, I, hey, them beside of you, around you, whatever, it won't matter. You'll come unglued. Amen. I, when you realize, I, hey, you're saying we can sit at the king's table, eat from the king's table, enjoy the king's things. Why? Because we are in the family. Amen. What a family to be a part of. Amen. I want you to know something else. The riches of his grace restored our privileges. At the end, David said this. I'm going to give back to Bathsheba's shelf. Everything is took away from Saul. I'm going to give back to him. They're going to plant the vineyard. They're going to till the ground, get some Athebus shells, and they're going to harvest it, and they're going to bring it in. Hey, listen to me. You say, preacher, what we lost in Adam, we gained in Jesus Christ. Hey, Amen. Yeah. What we have to be sad about. Hey, Amen. Hey, he give it all back to us. Hey, we was lost on our way to hell. And he sent the most precious thing that heaven had yes, he to go to Calvary and die. Hey, listen to me. And he died on that old rugged cross and paid our sin debt. Went to the grave and resurrected. Listen to me. When he resurrected, he started giving us back all them things we had lost in Adam. Hey, Amen. He said this. You don't have to go to hell. He said it's a who... So ever will. Salvation. Aren't you glad that tonight? Amen. Aren't you glad you, God didn't put no stimulations on coming to him? Romans or Ephesians chapter 1 verse number 3 said this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We're rich tonight. I was in my study some years ago and I read this story and I told my church that I can't find the book again but they asked this lady said, she lived in England they said ma'am said, what's the most memorable guest that's ever come to visit your house she said probably the queen of England they said but what about this Jesus person you talk about she said oh he's not a guest he lives here I want to ask you tonight, has there ever been a time he went home with you? Has there ever been a time when you asked Jesus Christ to become your Savior? You say, preacher, what are you so happy about tonight? Hey, I don't have to go to hell. Amen. Oh, oh I heard them old preachers, one of them used to say this, we're heaven bound with a hammer down. Amen. Hey, the thing is, is this. I preached about it later tonight. The devil may throw us some stumbling by. He may throw some stuff out there, but listen to me. He can't get our souls without folks. Oh, what a privilege it is to be in the family of God. Hey, people think we're crazy now. They think, why in the world would you come to church on Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, or any other night, go to church? Hey, why wouldn't you? Hey, man, just get around God's people. I don't know about you, but I long for Sunday. I long for Wednesday night. Hey, I just want to be around God's family. I like to be around God's family. Amen. Amen. Hey, we, hey, we live today in the greatest days. Because, hey, in the church room, family we have, and friends we have, we ought to praise God. Amen. Hey, the world don't know nothing about what we got tonight. 
But they need to know what we got. If they really knew what we had, folks, they would run as fast as they could to Jesus Christ. If you're here lost tonight, he loves you. He'll save you. If you're here tonight and things ain't right in your life, won't you let him do a work in your life tonight again? Won't you come and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, I just want to serve you with all my heart. I said last night, or other night, listen to me. You say, preacher, if you could do it again, would you do it again? Oh, yeah, I'd do it again. I'd do some things different, but I'd do it again. Because I don't believe you can go wrong investing in people. I don't believe you can go wrong helping people. I don't believe you can go wrong loving people. You say, preacher, they don't always do me right. No, they won't always do you right, but you still love them. Love God. Serve God. God take care of all them things. I'm learning that. Amen. Hey, preacher's flesh just